Welcome to the Aspen Institute. My name is Ross Wiener. I'm a vice president here at the Aspen Institute and executive director of the Education and Society program. So welcome to the Aspen Institute. Thank you for joining us this morning for this uh, release event and panel conversation about the Common Core standards. So uh, as is the Common Core, this panel itself is a work in progress. So two announcements. Uh, we, had, we had two state chiefs lined up to be with us today. Uh, Lillian Lowry um, was going to be here from the state of Maryland. Uh, she got called into a meeting with the governor uh, and her successor in Delaware, Mark Murphy, was then going to join. Uh, but Mark actually was planning on taking the Amtrak this morning, so uh, the Amtrak is not running in between Wilmington and Washington, so uh, Mark can't be with us. Uh, he actually put in a couple of questions that he wanted to make sure are in, so uh, hopefully we'll get some good advice for him from the panelists. Uh, and Sonia Burke and Santalisas uh, from Baltimore City, uh, hopefully will be joining us sometime in the next few minutes. Uh, so now let me introduce the folks we do have here. Uh, ju just to my left is Dwight Davis, uh, a fifth grade teacher in the District of Columbia Public Schools uh, and a Teach Plus fellow. Uh, Dwight joined us for really an initial conversation that shaped our understanding and our work around close reading of text, so we invited him to come back uh, for today's public conversation. Uh, and Mike Cohen, the president of Achieve. Uh, familiar to many of you, Achieve is an organization that focuses on uh, benchmarking standards against the expectations of college and career has worked with states for a long time uh, and was really a force behind the Common Core and now uh, Achieve is administering the PARC assessment consortia, one of the two assessment consortia that were funded to create new tests aligned with the Common Core. Uh, so welcome, thanks to both of you. Uh, and then let me introduce as well uh, Sheila Brown. Sheila Brown uh, has directed our work with literacy directors and chief academic officers in a network of urban school districts that the Aspen Institute facilitates. <laughs> so Sheila has run that work for the last five or six years and has recently joined our team full time as co-director of the Education and Society program. Uh, so welcome Sheila. And just before I turn to the program, I just want to introduce a couple of other folks uh, who are here. Lee Caps is here. Uh, who works with us on the literacy work and, and co-authored the Close Reading Primer we're releasing today, uh, and Joaquin Tamayo, uh, Assistant Director of the Education and Society Program, who worked closely with our urban district partners on the professional development modules that we're also making available today. Uh, so thanks to everybody. Uh, let me just walk through um, the event, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sheila so we can dive into the discussion. So we're going to start we are releasing a, a, close, a primer on close reading today. Close reading has sort of taken on kind of an oversized importance in terms of focus on the shifts that the Common Core is asking for. And uh, Sheila will talk a little bit about the background, but we were getting lots of questions. We saw lots of issues coming up, and we thought it would just make sense to put something out that just gives people a resource about what is this shift, what is it demanding, what are the expectations in the Common Core. Uh, and so she'll talk about that for just a few minutes and as, as well as the professional development modules that we've created. And then we'll have a little bit of question and answer on those materials and that work. Uh, and then we'll shift to the panel conversation and really have a broader conversation about uh, the Common Core. Where are we right now? It's, it's sort of an important moment to take stock. You could say in some ways that we are halfway through the first phase of implementation. We are uh, just about two years since adoption and since the assessment consortia were launched and we're so and we're just about two years until uh, the first statewide uh, assessments aligned to the common core come online from the assessment consortia both assessment consortia have released exemplars of what the assessments will look like just in the past few months which i think has really galvanized attention on so really what's this going to take and I think it's piqued a lot of people's interest so excited to uh, get perspective uh, both from the classroom and from the policy level on how it's going so far and, and what kind of work we need to do moving forward. Uh, so with that uh, I'm delighted to ask Sheila Brown, co-director of the education program at Aspen uh, to talk about the close reading program. Thanks Ross. Is that audible? Good morning. Um, thanks to all of you for carving time out of very busy days after what I hope was a three-day weekend for some of you. Um, but we're super excited to release some tools and resources this morning and just want to give you a little bit of background on both of the resources and, and 
the primer on close reading is, is available on your seats in its entirety, and then just sort of an overview of the professional development modules uh, should have been on your seat as well. And for folks joining virtually, uh, these resources are available on aspendrl.org. Uh, I was getting emails last night, so they are posted. I saw them this morning, so mm -hmm. feel free to, to, to jump in uh, online. Um, so wanted to take a few minutes um, to give you background on why Lee Caps and I wrote this primer on close reading. Um, and we, we want to continue the conversation with lots of folks in terms of how it, it may be used. We don't know how folks will use it. Um, so I'll give you some background on that. Um, and I'll also give you a little bit of background on the professional development modules led and managed by Joaquin Tamayo and, and a committee of folks. Uh, within the districts that we support. So in case uh, you're not aware, uh, here at Aspen we support 15 urban school systems on a regular basis. We convene their superintendents, their chief academic officers, and their lead curriculum and literacy folks <coughs> to help connect them to one another, to effective practices, to research, to the policy world. Uh, and so we populated our committee who developed the, pre the <coughs> professional development modules with some of our literacy leaders, some of whom are here today. Uh, so we'll get into that um, in a few moments. So background on the close reading <coughs> primer. Um, we're, we're advancing this primer um, for a few reasons. Um, and, and for those of you intimately familiar with the new standards, um, this notion of close reading as a teaching strategy is perceived as something somewhat new, it's been around for decades, but we really felt that the field could benefit from some clarity. So in the primer, we define what it is, what the attributes are, how it might look, how many days in it within a unit it might take. So Lee and I did a lot of digging uh, to, to bring some of that to what we hope is, is, is clarity. Um, we, we also um, very directly address a controversy that, that sort of hit, hit the internet, hit our conversations, our emails, around the role of background knowledge in how you teach close reading uh, across wide spectrums of children. So um, we are very connected to our 15 districts, to our literacy directors, to our chief academic officers, and we were getting emails from folks saying, I'm being advised to use this as the predominant strategy for teaching reading. I'm not sure how this fits with other strategies I've been using for 20 years. Can you give me some advice? So this is, this is our first attempt at providing advice, but very directly addressing the role of background knowledge in the teaching of, of clo the close reading strategy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about who we brought in to inform some of the decisions that Lee and I made on the paper. Um, we, we also, I think, frame the, the use of the close reading strategy uh, very, hopefully clearly, uh, within the context of a comprehensive literacy plan. So all of our districts have one version of another of what it means to be a teacher of English language arts and literacy in pre-K through 12. And so where does this close reading strategy fit within that context? Um, so again, you tell us if we met that goal when you, when you read the, the primer thoroughly. Um, I, I guess another sort of driving force behind why we wrote this primer uh, was to advance the, the, the hope of equal access and equity that we think the Common Core aspires to be for all children. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to elevate uh, the teaching of close reading as clearly an opportunity to engage all students in increasingly complex text over their K-12 years. So that's another aspiration that we defi definitely want your feedback on as well. Um, so so here's, here's the journey uh, that we took. So Ross alluded to the feedback we were getting, the emails. Lee and I were in conversations everywhere. Lee works as a, as a private consultant it, with many state departments across the country. And we were hearing this, this angst from a lot of our leaders, or, or maybe the lack of angst, in employing the close reading strategy to the exclusion of other research-based strategies. And so 
Last March, Ross and Catherine Snow, who's the co-director of our Literacy Leadership Network, who's a professor at Harvard at the Graduate School of Education, the three of us sort of put our heads together and said, we, we've got to like, circle the, the wagons on this issue. So we decided to bring together a very broad-based group of people and host um, a roundtable discussion in which Dwight was a part and just really hash it out. Like, what is the reading research community saying about the relationship between background knowledge and the teaching, the close reading strategy? Um, we, we had folks from all over the country, George Butch, Butch, uh, Bunch from Understanding Language was on the panel representing the interests of English learners. Um, Catherine herself and, and lots of people, lots of practitioner leaders, many of our literacy directors, a few of our literacy directors were present. And so this primer sort of brought to bear some of the points of consensus from that roundtable discussion. Um, Lee and I continued to dig through research and, and have conversations and, and ask you know, for reactions and feedback on the paper. Um, so, so that's how we landed on, on what's in front of you. Um, I also think it's important to share what the primer is not. And those of you who have been teachers of reading and writing, you know that it is not the end all be all of how you teach reading. Uh, so so it, is, it is an effort to clarify some of the messaging that's out in the field on how we approach reading standard one in the Common Core State Standards, that we want students to read closely and extract evidence and draw conclusions from the text. Um, but it is not uh, a set of specific guidelines for how you might employ the close reading strategy with a non-English speaking student who's been in, in American classrooms for six months. It is not a set of guidelines for students with special needs, um, with explicitly de defined special needs. I think that's version two, maybe. Um, but it, it, it was really in an effort to clarify some of what we thought was, was misleading, while at the same time advancing uh, the excitement that some of the early adopters in the field with whom we spoke, um, the, the, what they're finding this is really doing in terms of giving all kids access to, to really complex text. So um, you'll be the judge of whether or not we met those goals and aspirations. Um, and so I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes before we open it up for comments and questions about the primer to talk a little bit about the, the professional development modules. So, on our digital resource library, aspendrl.org, you will find um, a series of professional development modules that Joaquin uh, Tamayo and a committee of literacy directors and a Common Core State Standards consultant with whom we work um, developed. And th we've been releasing a series of professional development modules over the last year and a half. Um, and so these three modules that are released today um, focus on what teachers really might need to know about text complexity, since that's a, a really important tenet in the Common Core State Standards, and represents significant shifts in terms of rigor and, and what kinds of texts we need to be putting in front of children. Um, the second module is focused on the close reading strategy and the development of text-dependent questions, which is quite central to how we teach close reading effectively. Um, and then the third module is how to design close reading lessons. So we have a couple of exemplars in these modules. And so um, in my former life as a deputy superintendent and a director of reform and principal, um, professional development is is essential to uh, gaining understanding and learning as a teacher. So, so the, the, the focus of the modules is on the, the teacher level, um, but we acknowledge that these materials also might be used for coaches, specialists, certainly principals, but that they would need to be modified. So what you'll find in these modules are very explicit fa facilitator guides so if, if you are well-schooled in the teaching of reading and writing, you could pick up this guide with the accompanying PowerPoints and, and facilitate these sessions. They were designed um, 
in about six hour increments, which is sort of the norm in terms of professional development. It's about a full day of training, six hours of content and, and activity. Um, but what we really encourage all of our districts and any of you to do is, is to customize them. And that's the beauty of open source materials uh, is that you can take them, you can make them your own. We encourage our districts to put their district PowerPoint slides to use those instead of the Aspen Institute slides. We, we, we want these to be useful and we really want feedback. So one of the things you'll also find is Joaquin's email address for any and all questions, feedback, um, and certainly feel free to ask any of those questions this morning. Um, so um, with that, I, I think uh, we'll just open it up for any questions or comments. Uh, in regard to the close reading primer or anything more you'd like to know about the professional development modules. Yeah, so in a few minutes, we'll transition uh, to the panel, but just wanted to give folks uh, a chance if you have any questions about the close reading materials, if you have any comments you want to uh, put on the table. Uh, yeah, right here. And if you could just wait for the mic and if you could uh, identify uh, yourself and then ask your question. Yeah, I'm a Raphael Heller. I'm a consultant here in, in town. I'm curious in these meetings that you had with Catherine Snow and others, um, to what extent it was split between, say, elementary and secondary levels, and, to, and did that have much of an impact on the discussion about close reading? Were the elementary and secondary people on the same page? Uh, I, I think we had, uh, we had K-12 perspective on the panel. Um, and a couple of folks uh, in the room were there. And I, I think one of the things that always comes out when you start to talk about secondary youngsters is for, for so many of our urban districts, the gaps just continue to get bigger and bigger. So I, I think addressing students with significant gaps was part of the conversation, but in terms of, you know, was there a division in terms of the utility of the strategy? I would say no. Um, and it, in follow-up, um, I reached out to teachers, both elementary, early elementary and secondary, uh, employing the strategy and, and their, to a teacher was uh, great enthusiasm and success in employing close reading with, with, with the whole span of age groups. So let me just say two, two quick things on that. One is just to invite, we have a number of uh, our, the literacy directors from our urban district partners here. So if, if any of this conversation um, you know, inspires you to want to add anything in the conversation, please feel free. So just let us know. Uh, but just to that point quickly, I think one of the, the challenges that we're going to have to confront is close reading is really a disciplinary literacy strategy. And so you are going to want to engage uh, social studies teachers, science teachers, teachers in the technical subjects. How do they? implement close reading in their content area. So I think that's one challenge that's going to play out somewhat differently. In elementary schools, you're going to have teachers who are already used to teaching reading. Uh, so that is something we talk about a little bit in the primer. Yeah, in the back. Thanks. Peter Gutmacher from the DC Children and Youth Investment Trust Corporation with a question for Joaquin. Joaquin, would you be available to consult um, about <laughs> Uh, how to integrate close reading into a non-school day, school room uh, context, uh, like such as an after-school program or a community-based organization, uh, the kinds of things that young people are doing after school. Uh, well, I'd be happy to discuss with anybody how that might be implemented. And so these tools are made to be adaptable for districts and schools, but I think that falls within the preview of how any organization working with young people around their literacy skills can use these resources as well. Yeah, question right up front. Oh. Oh, if you could just wait just one second, the mic's coming. Thanks. And if you Barbara, could uh, just introduce yourself, let us know. Barbara Cambridge from the National Council of Teachers of English. I'm noting at one point in the um, document you say that, especially for students with lower reading skills and gaps in background knowledge, close reading can be an important strategy. Another spot, however, you say that teachers have to make a decision about whether uh, a text is appropriate for close reading or if students are ready for the rigor that close reading complex text demands. So I'm just wondering about whether those are contradictory or complementary statements. 
I, I would submit that they're complementary. I, I think what we're trying to get at is that there, there, are, there are lots of decisions teachers have to make in terms of which texts they choose to use in a close reading approach. And in terms of youngsters with little to no background knowledge on a particular topic um, or on a particular topic with which they have no background and the, the reading level is, is hugely beyond the, their capability, um, teachers may decide not to use that text selection with a group of youngsters. But what we also, I think, say clearly is that the background knowledge can be built as long as it's not uh, a reading of the text itself in advance of the close reading experience. Too often we find that over scaffolding takes place in classrooms if teachers even put more rigorous test texts in front of children. So um, just want to acknowledge that teachers need to know their, their children very deeply, as you well know, and that that has a direct influence, their background knowledge, on how much they can access the content of a reading selection. Lee, did you want to add anything? No, I, I think that that pretty much sums it up. And that is a big part of the discussion right now. How do teachers orchestrate all of those decisions in order to do the best thing for the students in front of them? Other questions, comments on the close reading topic? Yeah, I'll just say on this point in particular, this is something that has been very much uh, in, in the middle of the conversation. And I think, you know, when you read the, the primer on, on balance, I think we're actually trying to uh, encourage teachers to push their students to challenge them and to trust them more. I think one of the things we feel like we've seen over time is that, you know, when you teach students to a higher level, uh, they'll learn at a higher level. And so one of the things we're worried about is that it, teachers will, uh, in a sense, um, underestimate their kids' potential and will pitch things to them at a lower level thinking that's all that they're ready for. So I think on balance, actually, the primer is uh, asking teachers really to challenge those assumptions, to look at what the Common Core is going to ask for, to look at what their kids are going to need to be ready when they go uh, outside of school, and to really make sure those, those challenges are, are put in front of the kids. and then figuring out what kind of support it's going to take to get them to be successful there. So if there aren't any other uh, comments, thank Great. you very much, Thanks, Sheila. And I think we'll turn and uh, then try to get some broader perspective uh, from our panelists. So Dwight, I'm going to start with you. Um, as a classroom teacher in DC, so Washington DC is one of the first systems that really has uh, at least attempted to implement Common Core fully. Uh, to really have it shaping instruction right now. So I guess my first question is, um, do you notice a change in, in your instruction? Uh, do you notice a change in the professional conversations in your school? Like, what, what's the big deal? Uh, has, Co has Common Core changed uh, what's going on in your professional life? Sure. So first, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Uh, I think you know, having a teacher's perspective is crucial for our progress as we move forward. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking about this question over the weekend, and I think the Common Core has really changed the way that I teach in a number of ways, and I have a few listed. I'll try to get through them as quickly as possible. Number one, it, it kind of forces me as a teacher of reading to, to talk to other teachers, right? So, um, so we're about to start an informational text um, unit, unit two, and part of it is that students have to, so with, in fourth grade, students have to pick one piece of evidence to support their thinking. Well, when you get to fifth grade, you have to pick two pieces of evidence to support your thinking. So then I go back to the fourth grade teacher and say, well, how did you teach this? What went well? Who were some students who, who wrestled with that? And then I go to sixth grade and it says, well, you have to pick information and you have to kind of like discuss your analysis of the text. And so now I'm saying to, my sixth, to the sixth grade teacher, okay, so how are you approaching this standard? to inform the way in which I teach or the way in which I unpack the standard, right? So now you have this, this kind of, this meeting with you know, the, all the ELA teachers and we're kind of trying to wrestle with this together, right? And I think that's extremely beneficial because that helps the students. Um, another way in which uh, it's impacting my instruction is that like last year, um, 
I kind of focused on the bottom 20% of my class because, you know, in, the tip, in, my, in my classroom last year, I had so many students at least two years below grade level. So I, I had a Wilson intervention program that I did, uh, you know, small group instruction. So, but this year with Common Core, it's like, you know what, because the standards are so rigorous, I need to spend time with all of my students. I can't just say the bottom 20%, I really need to get them reading to where the middle, the middle of the class is. But I have to try to figure out how I can meet the needs of all of my students right away, right? And so now what's happening is my Wilson intervention group that I work with will now take place after school, right? So it's extended my school day. Um, so, um, so one, you know, it forces me to collaborate with my, you know, uh, grade level partners and uh, other teachers within the building. It, it's extended my school day. It's kind of forced me to think about my small group instruction. Um, how am I grouping students? How am I, you know, getting at those skills that students are missing? Um, so yeah, so I, I think it's 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 really caused me to say, okay, well, in my informational text unit, if I focus on Abraham Lincoln, what is the, what is the text that I'm going to use that this has a different perspective of Abraham Lincoln, and how am I going to get the students to talk about these two different texts and look at the different ways in which the text is structured, right? So as a teacher, it's like, it's so much stuff that I have to do that I didn't necessarily think about before, right? And, and the other piece is that I have to get to the skills faster, right, and deeper. Um, so it's, it's really made my job a little bit more difficult, you know, um, because one, I, I'm a conscientious teacher, right, and I, and I want my students to leave me, you know, at the highest level possible. So it, it really requires a lot more thinking, a lot more work. Um, but but I, think, I think what students will take away from it is a, a deeper philosophical understanding of what reading is. And as a teacher of reading, I really value that. Right? Because it's one thing to just go to the next grade and know how to make an inference, but to know, but to know why a particular author put particular evidence and facts in there and to articulate, well, I think they did this to persuade me because blah, blah, and they can articulate and talk about it. Like, I know that I'm preparing my, my students for college, and, and, and that's the goal, right? So I think that's how, some ways in which it's impacting me and my, in our school. Excellent. Let me stick with you for a couple of questions, okay. and, then we'll, and then we'll bring Mike in. You had talked a little bit, actually, about uh, how your school itself uh, reorganized uh, teams oh, yeah. around this. Talk, talk just a little bit about that. So, so uh, for, for a few years now, like, I, I've really been pushing that to, to um, departmentalize. Um, and with that elementary education there, are a lot of, you know, people say departmentalization is good, departmentalization is bad, um, particularly when you look at students in grades two and three. A lot of people feel like, oh, that's a little bit too early. You know, there's a the developmental needs that we need to tend to in reference to the child. So departmentalization departmentalization is not good. However, with you know, because we knew a few years ago that Common Core was coming down a pike, and I and I and I believe that I was like, you know what, we're going to have to departmentalize because there's just no way that I can go as deeply with liter let's say you know in reading and social studies and have have to you know uh, teach math and science right um, so for me uh, it's it's a tremendous benefit because you know um, when we w when I teach the reading standards they're they're finding their way into writing and the writing standards are finding their way into reading so if 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 I'm teaching you know how to identify a main idea and supporting details right I'm going to make sure that our writing, that, that our writing unit is, is closely connected to that because I want them to kind of see where the standards kind of intersect and, and, you know, to see those particular structures. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the school year, I want students to not only be able to identify the structures, but to articulate why this particular structure is best in the, for this particular purpose, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, so one more question mm -hmm. uh, b before we bring in Mike. Um, so you're probably familiar with the impact uh, teacher evaluation yeah, system. So. so that's been a big push in DCPS right. over the last few years to make sure there's very rigorous teacher evaluations uh, that look both at student achievement and at professional practice. So I'd just be curious for your perspective on 
Have, have these two things, these two priorities, uh, merged together well in terms of practical implications for you? Do you feel like if you do well against Common Core, you're going to do well in Impact? Or are there, are there tensions? Are there things you need to do differently for the two, two systems? Just how do those things, uh, how are they, how are they uh, working in, in your world? I mean, you know, good teaching is good teaching, you know. And, and I've kind of decided, you know, that if, if I'm the best teacher that I can be, impact will take care of itself, right? So, so that's, that's my, where I am philosophically. And it's ironic because my, my master educator came in maybe like the fourth, fifth week of school, and uh, I was evaluated. And because I had focused so deeply on Common Core and getting students to talk about the text, getting students to identify, we were working on character traits and character motivations, and so, um, I really designed my lesson so that it will become kind of like a seminar discussion. So it's not the teacher kind of directing, but it's like, you know, well, this person is going to make a comment to that person, and that person, and so we have hand signals like, I want to build on what that person just said, Mr. Davis. I agree with what that person said. I disagree with what that person said. I see what that person, so there are all these nonverbal <laughs> kind of um, signals that are, that are taking place, right? And what I'm listening for is, are the students able to articulate their character motivations, character traits, so forth and so on? Are they able to analyze the text and communicate that to their uh, um, uh, peer, right? The students are just happy that they're able to talk, right? <laughs> Without being yelled at, right? And, and so, and it, it actually worked out well, right? And the master educator, was, she was in the back of the room just writing so fervently. It just, nodding her head and I was like, oh my God, this can either be good or bad. I hope it's good. <laughs> um, but, but, but it worked out, right? So, so in, in, in that particular instance, I feel like impact is neutral because impact wants to look at good teaching, right? Our students engage and, and there's specific teachers that the um, evaluators are looking at. And if, if, if you unpack the standards and you teach to the standards and you, and you provide students a, a meaningful opportunity to express what they have learned. And I think that's key, right? Because it's one thing to teach students, but it's another thing to teach students to express what they've learned in a meaningful way and to have an opportunity to talk about it on a regular basis, right? So, and I think, and I think that's the, th you, know, you know, we can, we can roll out Common Core, we can come out with a new type of standards, but, you know, unless the standards are taught in a particular way, you know, unless the, the teaching is effective, you know, I think that's, 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 that's the issue. So, you know, my teaching that day was very effective. So it worked out. That's a great story. <laughs> that sounds like a very dynamic classroom. I actually want to come back to that professional learning and how, how you learned and, and how you're seeing your colleagues learn about the standards. But Mike, I want to draw you in and first, just broadly, um, what are you, what are you learning? Uh, administering the park system, helping states get common core, up and running. Uh, what are you learning? Uh, maybe uh, some things that are especially promising or exciting about the work, and maybe some things that you think uh, need more attention or are going to be big challenges moving forward. How much time do we have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but before I respond to your question, Russ, I first want to thank you and, and, and Aspen for creating the primer and for creating this uh, this session. As you pointed out, this business of close reading is really important, not always well understood, and and the, the more we can help people have informed discussions about topics like that, uh, the better off we are. I also want to want to sort of congratulate the, the districts that Aspen uh, uh, works with. The urban districts have been providing tremendous leadership on the implementation of the Common Core, not just within their districts, but across districts and in ways that benefit others in their, in their state. So I want to thank you for the, for the great leadership that you're Providing. You can take as much time as you want. <laughs> <laughs> and Ross, to you personally, <laughs> um, I also want to just, just build on something that Dwight said, because I think it's important. You spent some time talking about how your instructional practices are changing as a result of the Common Core. And I think that's an illustration of how important uh, and, and, and powerful the standards are. Compared to standards that states have developed in the past, these just demand changes in classroom instruction. And at the end of the day, we can do all the reforms we want and have all the standards that we want, but if we don't figure out a way to help teachers see the changes in instruction that are needed and make those changes, 
we'll pretty much wind up with the same results we've always been, been getting. So I think it's heartening to hear you talk about how your practices have changed and, and, and what you're learning as a result of that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So in terms of PARC, um, uh, uh, what have we learned? A couple of things. First, this is hard work. Uh, uh, developing assessments. First of all, this is not just about developing assessments. Though it is important to actually develop assessments uh, in this project. And developing good assessments and good assessment systems is hard. Developing assessments that are innovative, both in terms, for example, of their, their use of technology, but also in terms of measuring what we want kids to learn, is additionally hard and complicated. Doing that with a network of states that has 19 states governing the project, that's a challenge uh, also, and never been done before. None of this has been done before. So I think one of the things that, as that is, is I talk to, to folks in the park states, the chiefs and, and testing directors and others, constantly looking at each other and saying, this is a lot harder than we thought it was going to be, and it is. Uh, so that's sort of, the, if you will, the big takeaway. I want to talk about two specific things that we're learning and doing that I think uh, might be of some interest. So there might be others you want to ask about as well. First, when the states came together to form PARC, there was a agree clear agreement that because, because consequences and stakes were increasingly being attached to tests, whether it's school accountability or educator evaluation or student accountability, et cetera, these tests actually have to be worth teaching to. And everyone nodded and said, yep, we're going to build those. Uh, and, and at some level, that meant uh, performance tasks and constructed response items and the like. Turns out when you get into the work, it's more than that. And I want to just sort of give you a sense of it. When we started creating the, uh, designing the park assessments and developing the task models and specifications for items, the first thing we did was go back to the standards. And frankly, sooner than we had planned on, we built, began to develop uh, what we call content uh, frameworks, which basically spells out more clearly than the standards do themselves some of the big instructional implications and instructional shifts from the standards. And to do that, we worked with content experts from the states, many of whom who had been involved in developing the Common Core. Uh, uh, the key writers of the Common Core, uh, Sue Pimentel, David Coleman, Jason Zimba, were an integral part of the team, so we made sure that we weren't, uh, that we understood the intention, if you will. And we spent pretty close to a year developing these content frameworks and getting lots of input from educators in the states. And that was both to begin to clarify for the education community what the standards really demanded, but also to figure out what the tests needed to look like, what we needed to pay uh, attention uh, uh, to. So the key point here was we worked very hard to make sure we understood the instructional implications of the standards before turning to uh, test development. Then we created some prototype items and the original purpose for that was to uh, demonstrate uh, and illustrate for the uh, companies that would be developing the items what we were looking for. We also released those last August. Uh, it turns out that that was pretty uh, use pretty good way to signal to the field both what the standards mean and what the tests are going to look like, and that's gotten a fair amount of, of attention. Point is, the design process quite deliberately right, made the instructional implications of the standards drive the test, rather than creating another situation in which the test drives instruction. And rhetorically, that sounds neat, hard to do. It requires a fundamentally different approach to how we've gone about creating tests. So that's one, one thing that we, we, we knew we needed to do and we had to figure out how to do it and, and we think we're succeeding at that. <coughs> Second, different kind of illustration. Uh, the uh, assessments, both Park and Smarter Balance, are supposed to be measures of college readiness, right? The scores on the high school assessments uh, need to tell students and need to tell post-secondary institutions whether students are ready to enter and succeed in credit-bearing courses easier said than done. And one of the things we figured out pretty early on is that um, uh, the K-12 assessments, the high school assessments, right, the K-12 system can't decide whether the assessments are measuring college readiness. You actually need higher ed in the game. And we had started uh, PARC with a higher ed advisory committee 
Long story short, over a year's worth of discussion, we wound up changing the governance structure of parks so that when it comes time to making some key decisions about the content of the high school assessments, the design of the high school uh, assessments, uh, the evidence that will be used to set cut scores and the, and the determination of the cut scores themselves, uh, system leaders from higher ed uh, uh, literally have a vote as do the K-12 chiefs. So this is a joint effort and that creates a very different kind of partnership uh, than we have had between K-12 to and higher ed and that was not easy work to do. One other point on that. <coughs> um, you know, the K-12 to system has a pretty diffuse governance structure. 50 states, 15,000 school districts, thousands of charter schools. It looks pretty well organized compared to higher ed uh, on, <laughs> on most days where oftentimes the, at the state level at least there is not a governed system. Campuses or parts of the system govern themselves. So when we talked about how we're going to make park an indicator of college readiness that would be used by higher ed, we spent a fair amount of time asking the question in each state, well, who in higher ed actually decides whether the results are going to be used or not? There are still some states that we're waiting for an answer, uh, and that's partly because it's complicated. It's not well spelled out. So what we did in addition to changing the governance structure was work with each state to develop an engagement strategy for higher ed that basically asks the question, who are the people in the higher ed system from the faculty in each campus, right, to the academic leadership in each campus and the system-wide academic leadership and governance structure, who needs to be involved in making the decision about whether the results of the park assessment are going to be used uh, to make determinations about whether a student can take credit-bearing work. So this is a rather extensive process underway in each of the park states, convening higher ed faculty, convening campus leaders, et cetera, to talk about these issues and to provide input in every step along the way. That's a lot more than just developing some test items and figuring out how to score them. So those are just two examples of, of things that we have been addressing in PARC that are fundamentally different from how you think about developing tests in the first place, but are critical to the, to the effort's success. Great. Uh, so lots there to, to tease out, and, and I know some uh, issues still aren't even on the table, but want to stick with the assessment, uh, the exemplars at first. If well, I'm if I'm remembering correctly, uh, it, it when you have released those exemplars, it, it took down the servers. I mean, there was so much interest <laughs> that, yes. that so. Um, and by the way, uh, for folks who are f uh, participating in or following the Smarter Balanced uh, Consortium, I think they're releasing their exemplars actually today. Uh, so there'll be more out there for folks to to take a look at. But Mike, talk a little bit about. Um, how you're seeing those used. So on the one hand, they were meant to be kind of foundational for the test vendors, right. uh, the, the developers, mm -hmm. but, but obviously uh, those folks didn't, didn't crash the servers uh, right. getting in the queue for those. So just talk about what are you seeing in terms of, of places um, that are using them? What's right. the most proactive? And then Dwight, I'll ask you to talk about uh, how you would use them. Dwight passed me a note when you mentioned it. He said, can you get us those exemplars? <laughs> so we'll talk about that, but let's talk about how you'd Go use them at your school. Go uh, to uh, So um, they've turned out to be, I mean, people are hungry for examples of both what's going to be on the test and also what do the standards actually mean in the, excuse me, in the classroom. And the uh, item prototypes speak to both of those uh, needs uh, in, into a greater or lesser extent. So the appetite has been great, the need has been tremendous. When we developed those, we made sure that we didn't just put out what you might think of as naked <laughs> items, but actually explained what the items do, how they relate to the uh, standards, what the work is that students need to do, uh, etc. And uh, states have, the, the states have been using those in different ways. First of all, everyone is just being driven to the to the website and individual teachers and curriculum specialists like are looking at it and beginning to understand a, that this is real now, that they can begin to see what they and their students will be held accountable for in, in uh, uh, what turns out to be a few short years uh, from now. Uh, so and, and so, some states have been more aggressive than others in doing that, but people are finding their way to the, to the website um, uh, pretty easily. I'll also tell you, I, the, the day before the um, items were released, I was speaking at a conference in um, Virginia of all places. Um, they asked me to come and talk about 
college and career readiness and standards and the like, and I said, are you sure you want me uh, to do this? Yes, yes, definitely. So in the course, I was on a panel uh, uh, with um, a business leader and two college presidents, uh, and part of what I talked about was the Common Core, and I was asked to be able to, I was asked to illustrate uh, uh, what's different about the Common Core, and I thought the easiest way to do this would be to talk about the test item. So if you've looked at the uh, item prototypes in ELA, there's I think a seventh grade item that deals, that has students read three texts about Amelia Earhart. And one of the questions that they need to, um, to, to write about is uh, um, you know, look at two of the three texts, I think, and draw the evidence right, for why each author thinks that Amelia Earhart is a hero right, and evaluate that, something to that effect. I contrasted that with a seventh grade writing item uh, that I picked off a state's uh, website that basically says, write a letter to uh, the supermarket manager explaining why you'd like to use the parking lot for a car wash. People got the difference right away in terms of what these standards demand, uh, what kids are gonna, ought to be expected to be able to demonstrate. Uh, and uh, it had quite a bit of uh, chatter in Virginia. In fact, Virginia, ranked, I think, sixth or seventh among the states from which we got hits on the website uh, when the park items were released. So who knows what the conversation in Virginia around the Common Core is now, but I think it's still, go it's still underway. Right, and for those of you who might not uh, be following it quite as closely, Virginia is one of the just small handful of states that hasn't adopted the Common Core as their standard, so especially interesting that, that they're interested. Dwight, let me ask you, you know, just to, you know, you're interested in looking at these exemplars. I guess two questions. How, how would you propose to use them? But also, just talk about what have been your opportunities to learn about the Common Core thus far? Where have you gotten information from? Uh, what have those experiences uh, been like? Um, let's just, yeah, start there. Well, I, I, I think um, there have been opportunities for me to learn about Common Core. Um, I'm my school is part of the DC3, the uh, DC Collaborative for Change, and so basically it's somewhere between nine and ten schools working together to pool resources, uh, whether they are, you know, in the resources in the form of people or resources in, in the form of money that's allocated to, to our schools. And we kind of share professional development, share information, so forth and so on. So we have been discussing Common Core. Uh, we haven't... Um, been talking, you know, as deeply about its implementation. I think that's just starting to make its way down. You know, a lot of times, you know, a big school system like, you know, well, DC is big for me because I'm in DC, but I mean, it's small and relative, and, you know, when you think about other school systems, but it takes time for all of this information to tr trickle down. Um, so uh, there's not much, but there's a lot coming down the pike. So, you know, by next year, I'm sure there will be a vast number of uh, learning opportunities or, or more in-depth opportunities to learn about Common Core. Um, but your second question um, about how to use... How, yeah, please. No, no, no. no, no. Oh, well, I'll just I'll yeah, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sonia Bergen Santalisa, Chief Academic Officer from Baltimore City Public Schools. Good morning. Uh, welcome. So, Dwight, if you'll finish this and we'll... Sure, sure, sure. So, so um, how will I use them? So, so, um, so, what I've noticed, because I've been teaching almost 10 years, so what I've noticed is that students who tend to do better on standardized assessments are students who have this ability to switch registers. And what I mean by that is students who are able to, to speak the vernacular of their community, but then also um, know when to use have instead of has, right? So, and, and, and the way I figured this out was I was teaching math, and so I, we were using everyday math. And everyday math is a very different, because it's so, it, it, it's so heavy on, on the literacy side, right? So I, I started to notice that some students in my class were better able to answer the math questions than others, but the students who were not able to answer the math questions were, they, they had mastered their algorithm, right? So I said, wait, you know what? It's something about the language that these students understand. And so I want the assessments, I want to see some of the exemplars because I want to start teaching my students the language of the test, right? Because for me, it, all of my students are bright, they're brilliant, right? But 
there is a vocabulary, there's a certain syntax that the tests have or use that my students are not quite familiar with. So for me, I want to teach my students the language of the test. Because if I can teach them the language, to teach them how the questions are going to be asked, then I can teach them how to answer them, right? So there's like, a, I basically want to see the syntax, the language, to, to familiarize them with that. Um, and I feel like my students would do a lot better. So for me, that's why it is so important. But then, you know, how, 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 the, t how the standards are interpreted, right? Because I'm teaching based on a standard, but that's my interpretation, right? But how you design the test is, is your interpretation. So wh where does my interpretation end and your, yours begin, right? And I, and, I, and I need that to kind of prepare my students to do well, right? So. Great, so that'll be helpful even again past the exemplars to get scoring guides and examples of work that meets it. But I'll say in our networks, uh, both with the superintendents and the chief academic officers, we've used uh, early prototypes of assessment items, and I think it really has been an aha for a lot of those folks around just the level of the level of rigor, frankly, the level of stamina. Uh, some of these uh, <laughs> items are going to demand. I mean, there really are uh, longer passages, multiple passages, synthesizing. It's very different, I think, than some of the things we've seen in the past with very brief passages and very direct inferences, as opposed to really needing to analyze and draw from the text. So I would just encourage folks, if you are trying to, uh, to work with folks around deepening their understanding of the Common Core, really, I think there's really no substitute for actually getting folks to do the work. Uh, you can talk about what it's supposed to look like, uh, and we just use, the, you know, toss around words like rigor and depth, and, but when you actually, when you, when you come up against a seventh grade assignment, uh, and you have to try and work through it yourself, I think it really clarifies uh, what the demand is going to be for students and then what the demand is at the system level to provide those opportunities and that support and that instruction. So Sonia, welcome. I, I want to pull you into the conversation. I know Baltimore City has been working a lot on Common Core, so I guess uh, maybe a, a, a two for question. One, how have you been talking to folks about the Common Core? How, how have you been messaging um, the sort of significance or what the ask is and then what do you feel like you're getting back from the field in terms of reactions? Um, how, just how's it, how's it going in Baltimore so far? Great, and so the, the advantage is um, because I don't have my notes sitting in front of me, I'll be able to give a far, uh, far more <laughs> gut level um, response to that okay, question. Cool. Putting down. Um, in terms of in terms of messaging, we have really tried to message this as a shift um, in teaching and learning and a real focus around that and less around Common Core as the next initiative coming down the pike because um, we really feel that if we do that, it's a lot easier for um, teachers, principals, even central teams to just be able to almost check out and wait for it to pass. So a lot of our messaging has been around these are the standards that our kids should have always been right striving for. This is the explicitness of what um, the real standards for student performance should be. And so a lot of our early messaging was around this is the, the Common Core standards help us um, as a barometer, right, of directionally where our kids should be going. Um, I think the other piece uh, mo more recently, um, in the last two years or so, um, has really been around what are the shifts around teaching and learning that actually ground um, the Common Core. So even in very early stages, early steps um, within the Common Core work, uh, really trying to make some tangible changes evident for teachers. So, and Janice Lane is here who heads up literacy for our district. And one of the, the first kind of dips we did for, um, for across the district, but particularly in the elementary schools, was around this idea of increased nonfiction. And it seems very, um, very easy and just, well, can't people just shift? But we really wanted teachers to experience it in the ground level. So we invested very early on um, in more nonfiction text for our elementary school classrooms um, so that teachers actually saw and witnessed the shift from having bookshelves that had a lot of fairy tales and narratives to actually now having books about ants um, and planets and mummies and things like that that, that officially um, come under the title of nonfiction. In, um, in the upper grades, a lot of the work has been done, and again, this is in partnership with Aspen and, and some other Common Core partner districts um, around 
um, LCD, around the Literacy um, Design Collaborative. And really that work at the secondary level has been bringing in uh, content teachers who've traditionally been left out of um, discussions of literacy. So we began that work in the secondary schools with science teachers and social studies teachers specifically, again, as a way of giving folks at the school level a chance to feel um, what are some of the tangible changes that are going to be made to everyday practice. Um, in mathematics, I will be very honest, um, it's been a bit more daunting, I think, for teachers because there's a real content shift. So early on when we were focusing, probably in that first year, around the mathematical practice standards, um, teachers felt a little more comfortable with that. Principals could use that to say, oh, this harkens back to some of the NCTM work we, uh, we've been doing. And so folks felt a little more comfortable around the practice standards, and I think that's still true. I think within content, and if our head of mathematics was here, what she would say is it really has been far more tentative in the field, with people saying, really? If I just focus on numeracy deeply in the early grades, what about all this other stuff I'm leaving off? And particularly in the transition between the current state test and the park assessments that we're all looking forward to, there's a real sense of kind of responsibility and angst and dissonance for teachers who want to be looking forward, um, want to be really embracing the Common Core content, but frankly are um, nervous that the initial dip that they believe they will take or the initial hit will negatively impact not only them but their students. So we have a lot more trepidation, I think, in the field around the content shifts in mathematics. Literacy feels like, for a lot of people, what we should have all been doing before. Um, a lot of the feedback from teachers, I get more cheers, we get more, um, you know, not cheers from everybody, Janice would tell you, but, but we get far more <laughs> feeling of warmth around the, now they have permission mm -hmm. to teach writing again, that writing is now, a, has a preeminent place yet again in literacy. Um, the content teachers, as I said before, are buying into the fact that now their content literacy matters. It's not just, if I'm teaching chemistry, make me into an English teacher but there's now a regard that there is a language of chemistry and that's being brought to the surface. Again, I think in math we've had a harder, harder time getting the field to trust um, that if you spend a lot of time in the core areas um, demonstrated, particularly in the earlier grades, by the common core, um, that, that will actually get there. I think at the high school level, um, to be frank, people are like, whatever will work, um, because that's been, that's been an area as an urban district um, that we are trying to spend a lot more time on in terms of developing a trajectory. So at high school, I think it's still more like, look, anything that will help us move the kids. But at the, the earlier grades, we have a bit more resistance around the content shifts. Well, so that, that's great. Let me, let me ask you uh, one question uh, to, that follows up directly on that, and then if, if the others want to jump in. Um, so there's a, a couple of things around the kind of both incentives and pressure to make the transition that I'm curious about. How do you see this playing out? So I'd like if you could start with, is, are there ways in which the common core expectations are affecting the teacher and principal evaluation system design and rollout uh, that you're doing and then would love Mike and Dwight if you have comments on that or reflections on, on what you've seen or would want to see. Sure, and I would say with regard to teacher and school leader evaluation, we are still at the beginning stages of that, but I will say they're fairly significant shifts. So like DC and other districts who've adopted Charlotte Danielson, we have an instructional framework that defines good teaching mm -hmm. for Baltimore City. Um, version two of that, so schools had about a year to get used to that, teachers were working with it. Um, after about a year, and I will give due accolades, um, you know, after a lot of kind of internal reflection from a lot of our work with Aspen and with other partner districts, we realized to have an instructional framework that is separate and apart from the common core um, not only doesn't make sense but causes confusion in the field. So our version two this year has very explicit edits that reference the common core shifts, the instructional shifts embedded in the common core. And I think the real way we're going to see that um, take root, frankly, is when we roll out this year, we have a full district uh, test run of a new teacher evaluation system for every teacher in the district. Um, it will not count, but it will count this coming year in September. So we will be getting feedback very quickly from teachers um, about that. And then for principals, um, I will say there's been far more um, receptivity on both 
bodies, parts, whether it's school leaders or teachers, um, because quite frankly, um, and very directly, people are far more concerned about what the value-added method of computation <laughs> of the teacher evaluation and principal evaluation is going to be, and, and frankly, the qualitative nature of instructional frameworks and rubrics that actually refer to students' work as reflected by the Common Core has had far less um, kind of negative ripple effect in the field. Mike, what are you seeing in, in, in this area? So, uh, I want to reflect on a couple of things. Uh, one is, just to pick up on what Sonia just said, having an instructional framework that's unrelated to the standards doesn't make a lot of sense. We've managed to do that quite often, uh, but it's a good time uh, to stop. Uh, second, uh, uh, you know, we, we are at a moment when there are, in, in just about every district in every state, a handful of reform initiatives that are rolling out. Common Core implementation, educator evaluation, new accountability uh, indicators and models from, from uh, ESA, ESEA waivers and the like, on and on and on. Um, and as is typical for uh, K-12 education, it's not like there's a central driving force behind all of that that sat down and said, well, what's the right sequence uh, for this? What goes first? How long will that take before the next thing rolls out? We just don't ever operate that way. What I've been struck by is, is as I meet with folks both at the state level, but particularly with, at the, at the uh, local level, and I'm thinking, was it last summer, summer mm -hmm. before, uh, uh, when, when uh, Baltimore, Denver, and Hillsborough, Hillsborough got together, and I had, had the opportunity to spend a couple of days uh, w w with, with those teams, how hard district leaders have been working to put those pieces together in a coherent fashion, and that's where the burden of this uh, uh, falls, and what I'm struck by, because I keep thinking, oh my God, there's a train wreck coming, and there may well be, but I'm struck by how often folks at the district level, at the classroom level, is saying these pieces actually can fit together and fit together in ways that reinforce each other. I find that really quite, uh, quite heartening and hope that that's a widespread uh, feeling and that people can figure out how to do that. Last thing I would say, you talked about um, uh, uh, Danielson. Uh, well, it turns out there are a handful of evaluation models that uh, districts around the country are using and they all have the same challenge of figuring out how to put those evaluation models and the standards together. How fortunate it is that 46 states adopted the same standards so that districts can work together to figure out how to do that rather than having to tackle that on its own. And, and uh, well, in, in, at some point in a few minutes, I'll mention another way in which having common standards actually makes the work uh, uh, easier in terms of instructional supports and instructional materials. Mm -hmm. But it really is heartening to see districts working together to figure this stuff out rather than having to do it uh, 15,000 at a, at a time. Mm -hmm. Dwight, any reflections on that, uh, on the measures that are being used right now? I know you had talked about it felt like the observation actually went uh, sort of um, right. uh, aligned quite well with the instruction you were doing right. under Common yeah. Core. Yeah. Um, and, and just one note on the, you know, sort, sort of stay tuned. If, if it hasn't come out already, I know that uh, Charlotte Danielson is updating actually the framework for teaching and, and, and imminent. Uh, so sometime uh, very soon we'll be coming out with an updated uh, version that really does try and key on uh, some of the instructional shifts uh, in the Common Core specifically. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, it just it feels like there's this moment where professional learning is so critical. Uh, I mean, n you know, nobody, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say nobody has done this. Folks, this is what great instruction has looked like um, in, in, in great high functioning schools for a long time. Um, but making this, making the rigor and depth and, and level of challenge that the Common Core is asking for, the norm in every classroom and every school, means a huge learning agenda for teachers, for principals, for their supervisors and the folks who support them. Um, and so I, I guess I'm just curious again for any reflections um, on sort of what ha have you seen, you know, uh, especially effective methods for that kind of learning? What are you trying and, and what are you learning? And, and I'd invite anybody to um, start off. So um, in Baltimore City, one of the things that's been very interesting is a real combination of school communities and even central teams who I think are at a readiness stage to engage the Common Core 
um, from what it presents in its purity, right? So, so schools, for example, and I'm thinking of a particular school um, in mind, where the first year um, after the Common Core was released, the whole faculty, and Janice knows the school I'm talking about, um, got together with their math leaders and literally revamped their content to match where the Common Core was. Um, the teachers did it all. It was all their professional learning for the summer. They came back ready. And a lot of, um, initially, we're seeing some of the early results of that, even in the current kind of testing frame. That, those are schools on one end of the spectrum. And ideally, to be frank, I would prefer for that to be the model for every school. The reality, though, is across 204 schools within the district, there's not that level of readiness. And so one of the things that has been surprisingly, I don't want to say surprisingly, but, but helpful, a helpful developmental stage in that has been the creation of curriculum units that teachers can implement immediately. Mm -hmm. And why I say that that's not the end game for us is because I think the end game is teachers feeling empowered enough and having enough knowledge to make meaning of the, of the common core. But even though the units, and again, I'm smiling, having Janice in the second row probably killed central team trying to create them and the, the, the swarms of folks we had um, assisting us to do that, inevitably, I will say that because we took the time to do that with our partners, we could say with confidence that 73 quarters to 85 percent of all schools in Baltimore City had classroom teachers experiencing a new way of teaching based on the Common Core with the curriculum units we had developed. And it was safe practice. It was a way for teachers to get exposure to the Common Core, to what it actually might look like, to also feel empowered to critique, which oftentimes when you have something new and you don't have that sense of agency as an educator, be it as a teacher or a principal, it provided teachers with a platform to give ready feedback. You know, this worked really well, but we missed it on this one. And so we had immediate feedback in ways that I think if we had expected all schools to just jump right in and start aligning curriculum and doing all of that work, I, I think we would have had a critical mass of people who were still like, whoa, I'm trying to figure out what this common core thing is. So what we've really tried to do centrally is, is think of developmentally, how do we help schools on various levels of internal coherence, um, schools with very different maturity levels, for lack of a better term, with regards to some of the key components of professional learning communities where teachers do own their learning and are part of that. How do we support um, at every step of, of the way? And so we know now that we can't just keep churning out curriculum units forever, but for the entry stages, it's really been helpful for all teachers to have a safe way to engage. We incentivized it, so we brought you know, pretty books for folks and manipulatives. And so, you know, we were well aware that there were teachers who signed on because, ooh, I get a half a library of nonfiction on animals, so I guess I'll sign up. And in the process, actually found out they liked teaching this way and they liked the content and they felt that their kids could do the work. So I don't think it's, it's a one, one step piece and I think the real key for me from a district perspective is always keeping in mind the different readiness levels of different schools. So not holding schools back that have those teacher learning communities intact. Let them go. Let them do the development work and the pulling it out. But for those people who aren't, we shouldn't say, well, why don't you get your, you know, your teacher teams ready first and then you can engage the Common Core. So we've really tried to take a multi-pronged approach to that. Great. So Mike, and then, and then I'm probably going to have one more question and would invite you to get your questions and comments ready. So, so I think there's a tremendous um, uh, uh, need for some model curriculum mm -hmm. units uh, uh, as a tool for professional learning and as a tool for illustrating how instruction needs to be different in ways that I think are complementary to, but in some ways more powerful than releasing uh, uh, sample test items. Uh, this is an area where states are more active now than they have typically been around the uh, uh, implementation of standards. Uh, when their general stance has been, we develop the standards, we give the tests, we hold schools accountable, and otherwise we're a local control state uh, when it comes to, to curriculum. That's not true for every state, but that's, that, that's largely been true. So interesting 
dynamic under, underway. Uh, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than that, three of the race to the top uh, states, New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, asked uh, uh, Achieve, this is not Park, but Achieve, to help them have a conversation about how they could coordinate their investments in development of model instructional units. And after a couple of sessions with the chiefs and their um, uh, uh, curriculum directors and the like, uh, what became clear was coordinating the investments in development of instructional materials was going to be daunting for a number of reasons. Different ways of spending the money, different timelines, uh, just not a simple matter. But what they were able to agree to was to work on developing criteria rubrics for evaluating the alignment of the model instructional units and lessons that they developed to make sure that they actually reflected the standards. And uh, ACHIEVE facilitated that process among those three states. Student Achievement Partners are very much a part of the discussions and they began to create and test out uh, these uh, rubrics. Other states began to hear about this and asked us could they get involved in this as well and uncharacteristically for ACHIEVE we said no. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's hard enough doing this work with three states. Sit tight, we'll get back to you. So we worked with the three states until they had a chance to pilot these rubrics and test them out against materials they were developing. One thing they found, by the way, when they did that was few of the materials that they had been developing actually measured up to uh, uh, the quality criteria that they themselves had set. That gave them some sense that this is like everything else, hard work. This is going to take some, some effort. But they've been through that. They've been able to use the feedback to improve what they're developing. And we then said to other states that had come to us, we can't coordinate your uh, curriculum development, but we can help you evaluate the quality uh, and alignment of it compared, you know, based on, on, on some, some rubrics that have already been developed, if you'll accept them. So this is the power of the common, once again. Uh, uh, turns out there are now 20 states that have met, uh, sent teams and met with us several times uh, to basically learn how to use these rubrics to evaluate the quality of the, and alignment of the instructional materials that they are developing. And we expect to keep this going for a while. There are two benefits to this. One, that uh, uh, it, it is a capacity building effort. It is a professional learning effort for the teams that are involved. Secondly, what we're hoping to do with a juried evaluation process that is state-led, right, identify high-quality, well-aligned instructional units across the spectrum that can be made widely available. Again, they've all adopted the same standards, they're using the same criteria. If people can use them consistently, then states ought to have confidence in the judgment that other states mm -hmm. make, right, and ought to be prepared to at least consider the use of the materials that rise up through that process. And we see that, if we can figure out how to make this work, we see that as a way to get a larger pool of high quality models that are available more quickly than they would be if each state did this on its own. So we think there's some, there's some power here and there's a way to provide help uh, uh, to educators around the country with this. And by the way, we're happy to work with districts on this as well. There are a number that we've already begun to talk to to see if they want to learn how to use these rubrics together with each other and, and uh, evaluate the work that they're doing. Yeah, please. Oh, yeah. So, um, and listening and listen to uh, both of you respond, I, I think, you know, from the teacher perspective, um, one of the things that I'm often concerned about is time. Um, I, I wish there were more time in the day where I could collaborate with um, my colleagues that are a grade level below and a grade level above. Um, there's certain amounts of time allotted for certain things and, you know, I, you know, up until this point, I've spent most of that time doing, you know, reading inventories, trying to, you know, figure out where my students lie on the spectrum, Pontus and Vanilla spectrum. And I think, you know, if, if the opportunities were presented, as you said, I think more more teachers would would really move a bit uh, would move quick, more quickly to take advantage of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's just how education is structured. You know, at the top, you all get the policy, you implement the policies, and you know you have 
these forms where you can talk, where, where you know, if I wasn't invited, I'd be in my classroom trying to That's teach right. my behind off, That's right? right. So right. Um, right. I, I think it's important that the teachers are included, and that's what I love about Teach Plus is that there, there's, a, there's a table and, a, and there's a chair for, every, for a teacher to sit and listen and talk and discuss, because if there wasn't, then, you know, I would say, you know, teachers are ready to move quickly, and um, I would, if, if we could see that school, I wonder if their time commitments are structured in such a way to facilitate that. So then for me, it's like, how do, how do we make that happen for all teachers, you know, which would be, you know, one of the silver bullets, right? But, um, so yeah, so that's what I want to say. Like, I, I think many teachers are ready to move forward and, you know, are gung-ho about Common Core. It's, it's just how do we, how do you provide time for teachers to express their excitement, right? Excellent. Well, I think that's a great way to, to close out the panel and invite you to make comments, ask questions. Uh, so. If you just let us know and wait for the microphone to come around. Anybody, anybody have a, I have lots more questions. So uh, there's one right back here. And if you could just say your name. Uh, hi, my name's Paul McGowan. I'm with the Center for Innovative Technology. Uh, Mike, I was very interested in the comments you made er earlier on about Virginia. And I'd like to ask each of the panelists, what message would you give uh, each of those five states that are not yet uh, uh, signed up to the Common Core? Well, I'll give two. Uh, one I won't elaborate on, which is they are uh, really quite good, quite powerful standards that reflect uh, 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 better than any others what we actually, what kids need to know in order to succeed after high school. The other one I would say that I think is probably particularly important for a state like Virginia, military families, right? They move all over the country. Those kids deserve some consistent expectations. Uh, and uh, any state that has a large population of military families uh, and military students ought to be thinking about that. Either of you? Yeah. I, I, do you want to go? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say uh, to be an effective or highly effective teacher, you know, your practices are constantly changing and evolving. You know I mean, just, so, you know, to sit back and, you know, say, you know, we've always done it this way. <laughs> you know, why change it? I, I don't. I don't think that that benefits the, the, the child. I think that benefits the teacher who already have their plans and units already neatly packaged. But you know, to be a progressive teacher, those things have to change and evolve, and it's just part of the process. So, you know, just change is hard, but we all have to do it. So, yeah. um, for me, it's less about are you adopting the Common Core or not. Um, and it's much more about are you willing to put your current standards and expectations for students up against the benchmark that the Common Core sets. And I think the real issue um, is, for me, and I understand the beauty of consistency, um, is really are, are you willing to do more than just lip service and say that we, we already do this. Um, I'm in a state that did adopt the Common Core, and the first year, every state meeting I went to was, you know, we pretty much already do this. <laughs> um, so I think that the real issue is whether you're a state that adopted the Common Core or a state that didn't, really is are you willing to do the gut level check and ask yourself at the state level, at the local level, at the school level, is this really the standard that we've always had for all kids? Is this really what we've been teaching to? And if someone can authentically answer, yes, I'm less concerned about whether they adopt it or not, my, uh, my, my foremost concern is where are your standards for kids and are you willing to put yourself under the lamp light um, for that level of scrutiny? Terrific. Other questions, comments? Sarah, uh, if you just, there's, there's two in a row right here. Let's just take one and the other. Uh, Laura Bornfriend with the Early Education Initiative at the New America Foundation. I have a question for Dwight about your school restructuring. Um, you, you mentioned departmentalization, and then you talked a little bit about the early grades. Did, did the early grades departmentalize as well, or was that just something that happened in fourth and fifth grade? If you could just elaborate on yeah, what uh, actually happened. Yeah, absolutely. So we departmentalized fourth grade and fifth grade. Um, you know, and I'll spend to the students who are, hey, we're preparing you for middle school. Um, but, uh, you know, pre-K through third, you know, one classroom, you know, and, and in most cases, two teachers per classroom, which is phenomenal. So we had another right in front. 
and then we'll come over here. Hi, Juliana Pareva-Goya from SURF Institute. Thank you so much, uh, panelists. I really appreciate the opportunity to learn from you. You've talked a little bit about the standards for the students. Implicitly, there's been discussion about the development of standards for the curriculum with the rubrics. Dwight, you mentioned in your classroom that you have a new dynamic with students discussing amongst themselves. You specifically referenced the classroom uh, gestures and also the standards that students are having to meet about inferences. I'm curious if there's been discussion more broadly about standards for classroom dynamics that are consistent with the common core. None that I've been, been aware of. And I do think that there has been, uh, in a number of the conversations I've been in, there's been a, a very explicit recognition that this is going to demand a, a sort of a more active, more engaged student taking ownership of their own learning. But uh, to your point, I haven't heard of somebody, you know, where they have tried to um, sort of formally uh, articulate that and figure out how would you measure it. I mean, there are, I think there are things in the teaching frameworks about the classroom right. environment and That's how that works. So, like so. Impact. Right. So to be effective, um, I think it reads something like um, the teacher um, poses, um, you know, higher order questions to students, but then they receive a four students pose questions that drive instructions to one another, mm -hmm. right? So that's one of the places mm -hmm. where the, the teaching and learning framework overlaps with Common Core, right? right? And it kind of takes that into account. Okay. Give me a question right here. Hi, Melissa Kim from the New Schools Venture Fund. Um, so in your panel discussion, it seems like you've identified several gaps, like a curricular gap between where we are now, where we need to be, a testing gap between our current state tans, uh, tests as well as a park assessment, um, the, the teaching practice gap of where our teachers are currently to the content experts they need to be, and certainly our higher ed and teacher prep sort of gap. And I, what I imagine, and I think what I find from teach, talking with other school leaders now, is that they're lacking a vision for what this really could look like. So my question is one, are there videos that clearly identify and show what exemplar practices and teaching could look like? So just a, even a few, I think might be able to speed up what teachers could be doing in their classrooms to really set that vision. And then two, in your opinion, what do you think really are the high lever tr transition activities that should be happening in the next two years? Because as Ross mentioned, we're kind of in this like, midpoint right now and I think what really happens in the next coming years really will make an impact. So what do you each of you think should be the high level practices that school districts focus on now? Can I go first before I forget? Please. So first to your first question about you know what does it look like and I really appreciate uh, DCPS's rollout of Reality PD mm -hmm. and it's an opportunity for teachers to see what exemplar um, practices are based on the teachers within the teaching and learning framework, so that's one place. Um, there are other websites um, that teachers can also refer to. Um, uh, well, I, I actually watched a phenomenal TED video last night, so um, that that really helped me kind of understand, you know, put stuff in a particular framework. Um, in reference to your second question about what are what things need to happen now, and for me. I, as a teacher in the classroom, I think what needs to happen for me is time with um, my grade level partners and partners above and below. So, because what I would like to see happen is, you know, I want to see how the fourth grade teacher is going to roll out, how they're going to teach, I want to see their units, what they look like, and I want to see sixth grade units and what they look like, and I want to put myself in the middle. And I want to be able to say, okay, so if I, if I get fourth graders who are now fifth graders who understand the standard and they're ready for the sixth grade standard, I need to be able to, to know what, that, what, what the other teacher wants, right? So I want to be able to have like these conversations where I can, one, help students, you know, make it, you know, master the standard, but at the same time push them towards the, the next standard. Mike or Sonia, Mike? A uh, hand, handful of issues from the state level that are, that are critical as transition activities. Uh, one, a number of states have done it. If they haven't done it yet, it's a little late to start. 
which is to transition the state assessments to better reflect the <coughs> Common Core so that teachers, students, etc., get experience with Common Core-like items, if you will. And the reason I say if they haven't started now, it's probably too late, is because of the the, 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 the cycle and the development cycle that's involved in actually getting items onto a test. That's one area. Secondly, there are a set of uh, uh, policies that need to be uh, thought through as the tests, as the assessments change uh, that states I think are just beginning to think about now. Uh, growth models, right? How will the new assessments fit into uh, growth or value-added models? Uh, for states that have uh, graduation tests, what's the transition plan there? Uh, will they a, continue to have uh, exit exams? And secondly, into courses, right, is important. Uh, that's particularly important for PARC, where in math there's a commitment to end of course exams. If Algebra 1 remains Algebra 1 or Integrated Math 1 remains Math 1, as it's typically been, if, that, if the course content isn't changed, then we're going to have a huge mismatch between assessment and standards on the one hand and the curriculum on the other. So those are just a few areas where from a state level uh, there needs to be some, some pretty important work going on in this transition space. And I would echo in terms of, I'll take your second question first, in terms of what we should be prioritizing, I'll echo what Dwight said. I think the real priority given the timeline um, for us has been how do we push down to the teacher level as rapidly as possible? How are we giving teachers the space um, to make meaning of the Common Core standards by using them, by making mistakes with them, um, by getting feedback on their lessons in ways that are there. Um, I do agree that we have far, far more video resources um, and exemplars of what quality teaching looks like um, that make me drool when I think of my first year teaching and that if I had, could actually have seen someone with a guided reading group um, or doing writer's workshop, my life would have been so much easier as a sixth grade teacher in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, so I, th I think that we've gone a long way, but I also want to caution what I am beginning to see is the conflating of the pedagogy of teaching and the content that is implicit in the Common Core. And I think to our peril, we overlook the content, the true content shifts and grounding of the Common Core because there are serious implications for teacher knowledge. And particularly in Baltimore, and the example that I use is the same example that I think I used a year ago in an Aspen meeting of CAO. CAOs, and I don't think it was Lee at the time, it was someone else who was leading us through an example of a close reading of text. And we were in the middle of going through um, an example of text and uh, we, we made a reference to the pivot point right, within the text that we were reading and how the pivot point is being used by the writer um, to emphasize a particular idea. And I'm an English major and I stopped and said, excuse me, we're now at the level of this discussion where I'm telling you I have a critical mass of teachers who through not necessarily any fault of their own would not be able to now follow this conversation because they don't know what the pivot point in the text is. They don't know what we're talking about when we talk about pivot point. They don't know how to look for it in student, right, student discourse around that. The actual hardcore implications of now saying that, and I don't know how many of you, I have little people at home, that, that the little bear, you know, that kind of traditional classic early reader text that we originally thought was late second grade, has now moved to first grade. Right? What, what are the hardcore implications of, of text complexity and, and the implications for students? I mean, I have been with groups of parents where I put up a shot of Sarah Plain and Tall and asked them to guess what grade level they think this will now correspond to in the Common Core and had a gasp right, go through when we compared what they thought the grade level expectation was to what it was or showing some of the examples of student writing at the high school level. And so I think we can't, we can't de-emphasize 
the heavy content implications for teacher knowledge and for student knowledge that are implicit in the Common Core because the Common Core is, is very clear, at least in the early communications, that we don't discuss pedagogy. I think those of us in school districts, and I'm really clear about my kind of you know, very direct uh, manipulation of the core to push the kind of instruction I think needs to happen. But the core is notably silent on pedagogy and leaves it up to the districts to interpret. And frankly, the jury is still out um, about part of the reason why I think we've had such widespread buy-in is because we haven't engaged uh, as a nation in pedagogical debates about what we think in terms of methods of instruction. So I just, I just want to put that out there um, that I don't, just don't want to glaze over this mingling, this commingling of pedagogy and content because I think we do it to our peril if we don't distinguish. So just one quick comment on that and then I would ask any of you if you have any final, any final thoughts, any impressions you want to leave folks with. But just on that point, I feel like, so just to mention a couple of other places where video examples are out there now. Uh, America, America Achieves uh, has put up a video library of exemplar uh, lessons. Uh, Engage New York has a number as well. Uh, a, a private company, a for-profit company, LearnZillion, uh, is also sort of curating these and making them available. And so I think there are some great examples out there. The thing that I would say is to make sure that not just to send people some links, but to really create a, a deliberate learning agenda around leveraging those videos for helping people grapple with what they need to learn, what they need to be able to do in order to teach at the Common Core level. So have some frameworks, have some plans for analyzing the videos, for talking about the implications, uh, for giving teachers opportunities to apply it and get feedback, not just think that if you just send everybody a link, then starting next week they could just do that <laughs> themselves. Um, so let me make three quick announcements and then I'll ask the panel. We have a number of other conversations coming up at the Aspen Institute I just want to let you know about. Uh, next week, a week from today, uh, or no, a week from tomorrow, October 17th, we're going to have the Futures of School Reform, a project at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. They really sort of brought some big thinkers together to say, why haven't we made the progress we were hoping for over these last 20 years of reform? And so they have some very different ways of how would we look at these issues quite differently. So we'll have a conversation. We've got some provocative uh, panelists and respondents. Uh, the week after that, October 26th, Sal Khan is going to be here, interviewed by Walter Isaacson. Uh, both of those will be uh, l streamed live on the web. Uh, and lastly, just wanted to give a shout out to the Ed Trust National Conferences. I think it's November 8th and 9th uh, here in DC. And it's just a great opportunity for seeing work that's, you know, it's, it's really populated mostly by folks in schools and districts who are coming to talk about what they're doing to close achievement gaps. So if you want a sort of inspiring shot in the arm and, um, and, and some real practical uh, knowledge from the field, Ed Trust Conference, November 8th, 9th. Let me just ask the panelists, uh, just close it out for us. Sonia? Um, so I, I actually think that the hardest work around the Common Core is, is coming. I don't think we've hit the hardest work. And I, I would just commission everyone, regardless of your connection to schools, um, be it teachers, principals, or anybody else, that um, an experience in Massachusetts has taught me this, that actually when the first assessments come back, the real fight begins. Mm -hmm. And that's when people are going to ask the question, do we really want to do this? Do we really want to do this for all kids? Do we really think it's possible for all kids? And I think, frankly, experience in, in Massachusetts has proven not because it's it's arrived or anything like that, but I think because you had some key leaders who were able to communicate to the public the importance of a new standard um, across an entire community, that there was a significant shift. Not that it's the final shift or the last needed shift, but there was a significant shift in the quality of teaching and learning that young people in Massachusetts experienced and a shift in the overall achievement. I believe, you can, I don't think it's, you know, I have to be deemed a prophet to say it, when, when the first tests come back and kids who usually do well do not do well, that is when we're going to have our heavy lift. Because frankly, people don't, still don't, even though they're well-meaning, still don't expect kids in Baltimore City to do it. So I'm fully aware that I'm engaged in work that is counter the narrative of educational success in this country. But for others, that's where we're going to have to hold the ground and we're going to have to hold the line that this is the standard. So actually, I'd, I'd rather have a troop of people ready when that time comes um, than just 
folks who are kind of interested in what the course says now. Terrific. Quick comments from Mike and right. So I would, I would uh, wholeheartedly second Sonia's point about when, when the heavy lift is going to come. Uh, and I would urge uh, uh, educators in every community uh, to be working now to build the support for the Common Core and for its implementation, not just within the education system, but with community leaders outside. That's one area that Achieve is going to be doing a lot of work in in the coming uh, years, particularly with the business community and with third party advocacy organizations, where often you need people outside the education system to say, yep, this is the right stuff for our kids. Uh, the results don't look like uh, uh, the results used to look on our old tests, but the proper response to that is to keep working <coughs> at it, not to run away from it. Terrific. Thanks, Mike. Dwight. Yeah, so, with all the talk about um, when the students don't do as well as we expect, you know, you know, we have to work harder. I, I get that, but for teachers, that is, my IVA is much lower. Am I now minimally effective? What could the school system, system have done now to have me ready for this? How will impact change? Will impact change? Will the IVA go down? Will it go up? And I think these are questions that need to be discussed, like, right away. Um, but one question that I just can't leave alone is I, I'm wondering how with the emphasis on um, Common Core and the new assessments coming out, what impact do you think that will have on an ACT and SAT? <laughs> will, 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 though, will the Common Core assessment now be the standard by which, through which students are accepted? Because we have higher ed as a part of this. You know, I have a son who's 16, so, it, you know, and I have two more. This I'm, I'm wondering, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, I would say, so this uh, I think perfectly sums up the, the hope and the, and the challenge right here. Uh, stay tuned on that. David Coleman, who was instrumental in the Common Core, next week, I think, uh, mm -hmm. takes the reins at the College Board, the publisher of the SAT. So I think look for uh, changes and alignment there, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, so I please join me in thanking the panelists. It was a great discussion. Thank you, Ivy. Thanks, everybody, for coming.